In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Καλή Ανάσταση. Χρόνια πολλά και ευλογημένα. Yesterday, we began this beautiful interlude. It's a hard kind of phenomenon to describe, but having finished the fast of 40 days on Friday, and not yet really in Holy Week, it will begin, of course, this evening with the bridegroom service. Yesterday and today have a festive tone to them. Maybe we're familiar with all of the sometimes Western images, and maybe we have some of these in our own traditions where Palm Sunday is like a little bit of a dress rehearsal for Easter, for Pascha, and we have outfits, maybe some hats even, and we get the kids dressed up. It's like just a little bit of a foretaste, and it should be that because it is intended to be celebrated. It is a feast. That's why you smell garlic downstairs <laughs> emanating up, among other things. And wine and oil are allowed. And it's to give us, I think, an affirmation of what life is like. Life has its ups and downs. It has its crosses to bear. It has its darkness. And yet it has its resurrections. It has its triumphs, has light. And we really can't know one without the other. You can't know the bitter without the sweet. Can't remember how the ancient Greek exactly goes, but we baptized so much of the ancient philosophy, not by any good of ours, but by those early church fathers who were educated. Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, John Chrysostom, and the list goes on and on. And so that is what's going to maybe come across in the homily, reflection, some of that tension between where we're at today, the beauty and the celebratory nature of proclaiming Hosanna, deliver us, an acclamation of celebration and rejoicing, which we know is only temporary because many of those same in a few short days will yell, crucify him, crucify him. And we really, as human beings, um, can't fully participate in one without the other. And the church herself is united with these events. We are the church. So we don't just remember and commemorate and reenact something. We live them. This triumphal entry into the church today so beautifully filled with love and light. And then, sadly, in a few days, the betrayal, the arrest, the fleeing of some of Jesus' closest allies, the passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. And yet, something powerful is woven throughout. God's love is woven throughout these days and services and hymns. And it was somewhat of a fun, not so fun, but ironic mistake of language that yesterday in the gospel, when Jesus came to see where Lazarus was, because he was told, of course, and he knew that he had died because he delayed going there to Bethany. Where have you laid him? He asks. They said to him, Lord, come and see. Those were words that were used elsewhere in Scripture to have and encourage the people, Philip, Nathaniel, to come and see. And what happened after they said to him, Lord, come and see? Jesus wept. And what follows is what's powerful. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. They used the past tense. That, my beloved, is not the love that Jesus has. It's not in the past. It doesn't have any boundaries of time or space, no matter who we are or how far we've fallen or 
whatever it might be that has kept us from a relationship that we wish we had with him. We're all stuck with him, or he rather is stuck with us by virtue of our baptisms. It's at the baptismal service where the priest prays that the newly baptized or to be baptized will become a partaker of the death and resurrection of Christ. You should see the faces of some parents when they hear that word. It's a little bit jarring, but we tune out because we don't quite get it. Or maybe we do, but we miss the resurrection. But that is the symbolism of going into the font three days or three times like the three-day burial. And we fully partake and participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We can all, I would imagine, recall times where we felt like we were suffering, like we were in pain, and times where we have been on the other side of that pain somehow. Not to say that it's forgotten, but that it was the love of others, the love that is manifested by God in and through others that helps us. On this journey up to Jerusalem, and it's used that language has this motif of an ascent to Jerusalem. The cross is never out of sight. And in the Psalms, Psalm 122, it says, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. That's no accident that the Psalms have so much to say about who Christ is. It's also no accident that the Old Testament has so much to say about who Christ is. Another theme for what it is that we're experiencing today, especially commemorating the events of Palm Sunday and the various ways that Christ was received as he entered the city, he who fulfills prophecy is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Evlogimenos o erchomenos en onomatikiriu. God incarnate, the one who comes to call back Adam from the underworld. We remember Adam from that Sunday just before Great Lent, who was expelled from paradise. In Zechariah 9, 9, a prophet and a prophecy it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's where I got the idea of having a humble Volkswagen Jetta 1988. That was my vehicle in 1998. Seven, maybe 10 years old. In any case, he comes in humility and glory. That's the paradox. We have to live with it. Life is bitter, life is sweet. Life is death, and life is life. Humility and glory, do those two belong together? Maybe not for our human mind, our rational minds. But perhaps for our hearts, we can reconcile them. From the Matins this morning, a hymn says, He who sits upon the throne of the cherubim for our sake sits on a foal. Imagine Christ on the throne in the kingdom, surrounded by the angels, archangels, seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, as we see in the dome of the church. A beautiful, glorious throne and the humble one here on earth, riding on a donkey into the city. Accept praises of angels and the songs of the children who cried out to you, Hosanna. That's the hymn of the angels. We hear it at every divine liturgy, sung so often and so beautifully by our youth choir who we heard today. This too, and I added at the back of the church an icon next to the icon of Palm Sunday that isn't, let's say, typically appropriately meant to be shown just yet until the evening. That is the icon of Christ, the bridegroom. 
And I put that as a reminder to us, something to put alongside the glory of today, the pomp and circumstance, the joy, the garlic, the fish, the wine, the oil, the fun. Tonight, it gets real. It gets like it gets real for us in our own lives sometimes. Christ weds. He is wedded to the new Zion. He is the bridegroom. That theme is also here, and so the icon was there for veneration and to know that we will be here every evening this week, but especially these first three evenings to pray the service of the bridegroom, the matins of the bridegroom. He comes as a Messiah for all people, all nations. That too is why he was on an untamed beast, as the fathers have pointed out, because the Gentiles had no order or faith and he came to enlighten them, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people Israel. So that tells us his salvation, his kingdom is for all, universal. The Kondakion of Palm Sunday, seated in heaven upon thy throne and on earth upon a foal. Another repetition of that imagery of Christ in two places, one glorious and one humble. The other thing that is worth mentioning is that just prior to coming into Jerusalem, Jesus was in the house, at least according to St. Matthew and Mark, in the house of Simon the leper, someone unclean. And we know the trouble that Jesus was getting in time after time, leading up to now, for associating with those who the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jewish authorities thought were impure, unworthy, sinful. And yet, even at that very last moment on his way into Jerusalem, he intentionally chooses to see and be with and eat with someone on the margins of society. That is love. That is radical love. It's not past tense love. It's not conditional love. It's the love that God has for us. The other thing to remember as I joke about driving a Volkswagen is like riding on a donkey. Jesus walked everywhere. We never hear of him on any horse or anything. And these existed in this ancient Near East nor a donkey, nor any kind of chariot for that matter. And because he knew that the people expected this Messiah and they were already creating a buzz, especially having raised Lazarus as he did, but it was a buzz that was a bit mixed. Anticipation, excitement, but maybe some suspicion. And he condescended to do what he did yet again for us. St. Andrew of Crete says, he's someone in the 8th and 7th century, a Byzantine hymn writer, talks about our participation in these events, especially as they're depicted in the icon. Come then, let us run with him as he presses on to his passion. Let us imitate those who have gone out to meet him, not scattering olive branches or palms on his paths, but spreading ourselves before him as best we can with humility of soul and upright purpose. Spreading ourselves as much as we can, as best we can with humility. That's a powerful image. And we can bring before God all of the messiness of our lives, be they inner lives, family lives, work lives, or what have you, and he can change them. He has that power. He has that purpose. He has that way. So may we welcome the word as he comes. So may God, who cannot be contained within any bounds, be contained within us. 
God within us. Have we not just now, my beloved, welcomed the King of glory, the Word of God made flesh, not only as someone riding on a donkey, but as someone always present in the church, wedded to the church in love, coming ceaselessly, constantly, unendingly, daily, in power and glory at what? At every divine liturgy, at the Eucharist, the body and blood which we have yearned for. Many, as I've given a talk on frequency of communion, might receive today and maybe one other time a year. And it matters, it's important. And we have that encounter. We have that ability to have Christ truly dwelling within us. The uncontainable contained in us. Today, let us too give voice with the children to that sacred chant as they wave the spiritual branches of our soul. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. He comes to free us from all of our fears and insecurities. God is love. God is mercy. He is forgiveness. He is kindness. And he fills the darkness with his light. As we all know, that time is coming. And perhaps today, we're tempted to ride this wave of this triumphal entry and enjoy the aromas of garlic and fish, but not the gall, the vinegar, the buffetings that will be here Thursday evening as we celebrate, or rather participate, in the crucifixion of Christ? Are we tempted to just ride, ride this wave? And I'm not saying not to celebrate or have brunch. If you didn't make the reservation, you know I love brunch. But are we tempted to just fast forward to the other somewhat easy, more comfortable thing that we can participate in, and that is the resurrection? If we do so, we risk bypassing the passion Maybe because we're uncomfortable with suffering. I get it. It is uncomfortable. Anyone who has been in the midst of someone suffering from any illness, anyone who themselves have suffered, knows the isolation, knows the difficulty, knows the discomfort, knows the what do we say, knows the anxiety. I don't know how to console. It's true. We're limited in that way. But with Christ, we have a way. Are we embarrassed by the cross? Our children initially were a little hush. Yes, the palm is a symbol of victory. But in a few hours, what will happen with these palms? Whether on your dashboard or in your icon corner, they'll begin to dry and wither and rot. It's a powerful image, but death is defeated. That much is sure, that much is true. We can only reconcile this conflicted set of emotions that we have with the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's love makes it possible to bear it, to share in it, not just to observe at a distance, to understand it, and above all, to pass through it. That is Pascha. That is the Passover. That is the way that Adam is redeemed by the new man. He died that we might see his wounds as our own, and his wounds were there in the resurrection, and so too will ours. They will be there but they will be made new. They will be a source of love, of mercy, of kindness that we can show someone else. They will be life in the kingdom 
life in the risen Christ. Amen.